Hi everyone, Dr. Marta Perez here, board certified OBGYN and high risk OB fellow. And in today's episode, we're gonna discuss one of my favorite topics, external cephalic version or ECV. In other words, how to flip a baby from breach. Don't forget to hit subscribe so that you don't miss any episode. I publish them every Friday and we discuss pregnancy, birth and postpartum. Let's go. So what is an ECV? An ECV is called an external cephalic virgin. It is a procedure where doctors try to externally, meaning outside the belly, turn the baby around from a non-cephalic presentation like breech or transverse or oblique into a cephalic presentation. And why would an ECV be done or recommended or offered to someone? Well, if the baby is not in a head down position, putting it in a head down position can prevent a C-section since cephalic is the presentation for which babies can most easily and most safely be born in. Offering external cephalic virgins and people doing external cephalic virgins can really powerfully decrease the C-section rate because you take away one of the indications for C-section and instead that person is now a candidate for a vaginal birth. So who is offered or who can get an external cephalic version? Well, the first thing is we do external cephalic versions ideally at 37 weeks. They can be done afterwards, but they really shouldn't be done before. And why is that? Well, studies have shown that at 37 weeks, the external cephalic version is in a prime time where it's probably can work. And it's also not too early. When external cephalic versions are done prior to 37 weeks, there is a higher risk that the babies will spontaneously turn back into their non-cephalic presentation, making the whole thing kind of a waste of time. And so to avoid that, we do external cephalic versions at 37 weeks. And the other part of who is anyone who is a candidate to have a vaginal birth, whose C-section is not automatically recommended for, for other reasons, is a candidate to have an external cephalic version. So to kind of put that the opposite way, who are people who can't have external cephalic versions or who it's not recommended in? Well, one example is if you've had certain types of uterine surgery with a big scar in the muscular portion of the uterus, you're at high risk of uterine rupture with labor and labor and vaginal birth aren't recommended for those individuals. So for that person, since they're recommended out of C-section anyway, I wouldn't offer them an ECV. There are other examples as well, but that's like one of the ones that stands out. As long as you're a candidate in other ways for a vaginal birth, you're a candidate for an ECV. A common question I get is if I had a C-section in the past and I would like to have a VBAC or vaginal birth after cesarean, can I have an external cephalic version? And the answer is yes, that has shown in studies to be very safe. Okay, I'm gonna kind of go over some of the basics of what an ECV entails, and then we'll watch a short video together that shows an ECV being done on a model. So during the 36 week visit, there is an assessment of the fetal position. This can sometimes be done with ultrasound or it can kind of be done by just like feeling the belly. And if someone suspects that the baby is breached, then we can start discussing and offering external cephalic version. There are babies that are head down at 36 weeks that flip later on. I've had patients show up to their ECV and they're actually, their baby has already made it head down when they get there. In that case, they just go home again. And this is how I personally like to counsel patients about an ECV. When you come into the hospital for your ECV, first, before we get started, we're gonna do an ultrasound and we're gonna see the position of the baby. If your baby is now head down, congratulations, you can go home. An ECV has a wide range of effectiveness rates, but it can range to about 60% to about 80%. So basically, Basically, I like to tell patients there are four possible outcomes. Two involve the ECV working, two involve it not working. So the first option is that the ECV works, but the process of trying to turn the baby can be stressful for the baby and they can show us signs that that was a stressful process for them when they're on the monitor. And if the ECV worked, you're at 37 weeks, but if your baby's showing us signs of stress when we monitor it afterwards, the best thing may be to proceed with delivery then. So that would be an induction of labor recommended. The other option is that the ECV worked, your baby was not stressed out. We monitor your baby for a little bit afterwards, everything looks good, you go home and you either await labor or await your timing for delivery, whatever you have worked out with you and your doctor or midwife. The other two options are when the ECV doesn't work. So sometimes it doesn't work. We're not able to turn the baby. In that case, as long as baby tolerated the procedure really well, wasn't stressed out when we monitor afterwards, you go home and you're scheduled for your 39 week usually C-section or whatever date your C-section is recommended, usually 39 weeks. 
Sometimes it doesn't work, but again, the process of trying stress the baby out a bit. And so we have to do a C-section that same day. So delivery is that same day. So really with those four options, you have two where you're gonna proceed towards delivery that day. Those are less common. Yes, an ECV can stress a baby out, but that is much less common than your baby being fine and you going home. All right, so I counseled you about these four options. You say, Dr. Perez, let's do it. Let's do this ECV. What am I going to do next? Well, I'm gonna get the anesthesia doctors to give you regional anesthesia, which is usually a spinal, which is what we use for C-sections to numb you from the waist down. The reason is because the ECV can be really uncomfortable and it, people's natural reflex is to tense and guard their abdomen, which makes the ECV harder to do and less likely to work. So getting the patient a spinal helps relax them. They can't feel the pain as much except for pressure and it makes the chances of success higher. The other thing I'm gonna do is use a uterine relaxing agent. Sometimes if we're pushing on the uterus, it can start to tighten up and contract, which makes it harder to flip the baby inside. So the uterine relaxing medicine I give is terbutaline. Terbutaline relaxes the uterus. It also makes your heart race a little bit. So I always tell patients that will be a side effect and that will help us also achieve a more successful result. I personally like to do my ECV with two providers, so myself and another doctor. It can be done with just one provider, but I think it's much easier to do it with two. During the procedure, we will both be trying to rotate the baby and we'll also take short breaks to look with the ultrasound at both the baby's heart rate during the procedure and also the kind of progress we're making because sometimes you can't exactly feel where you are, but you can ultrasound and say, okay, the head is here, we're halfway there, we only have a little bit more to go, et cetera. If when we check on the baby, the fetal heart rate is you know, lower than it should be, oftentimes we'll pause, watch it, if it comes back up, we can get restarted. If it stays down, we may abandon the procedure, put you in a different position to help with the heart rate. And then of course, if for any reason, the pregnant person, my patient is saying, this is still uncomfortable or I don't like this, I want you to stop, we stop immediately in that way as well. And then finally, after we're finished, whether it was successful or not, we put the baby back on the external monitor that monitors the heartbeat and we watch it for usually about an hour or so. For people who had a spinal, it usually takes about two hours for them to get all the feeling back in their legs and be safe to walk around, etc. So we'll monitor your baby for the time and make sure everything looks good. Let's watch a video together about ECV. I found this video on YouTube. Okay, so you'll notice that there are two doctors here trying to do the ECV. One of them has their hands that started in the lower abdomen and what they're trying to do is elevate the breech portion out of the pelvis. The other person has her hand kind of cupped at the top of the abdomen. That hand is probably cupped around the fetal head to try to rotate. You'll also notice the person whose hand was initially low is now high. They've been applying consistent pressure up to the part that was on the bottom to flip it to the top. Let's watch it one more time. So as you can see, that person who's on the patient's left side um, is slowly pushing down and the person whose hands start at the top of the abdomen is slowly turning it down and around. As you can see, they push pretty hard. That's why spinal's recommended. Um, and they're also using copious amounts of gel. A lot of lubrication is really key to an ECV. Some people use oil, some people use gel, etc. They're also moving their hands really slow. I think that's really key too, is slow and controlled. Okay, so now you've seen the procedure and let's talk about the benefits and risks. So obviously the biggest benefit of an ECV is that it decreases the risk of having a C-section. Not every single person who has an ECV will end up not getting a C-section, right? Because sometimes the ECV won't work. Sometimes the ECV works, but labor still doesn't work out and someone has an unplanned cesarean section during labor. However, it really increases the vaginal birth rate because you're not automatically going to a C-section for a breach. And although C-sections are very safe and I have a whole video about C-sections, it is safer if possible to have a vaginal birth for both the birthing person and the fetus. So if we can get to that goal, ECV is a great way to achieve it. But nothing is without risk. And although ECV is considered very safe, everything has some small risk. So as we talked about, when I talked about those four options, in some of those options, the baby becomes a little stressed out and we proceed towards birth as a consequence of the ECV that day. That's not likely to happen. Like the most likely thing to happen in those scenarios is that everything is fine. There is no stress on the baby and it either worked or it didn't work and you go 
home. However, there is some risk of stress to the baby. Less than 1% of the time too, that stress to the baby can actually result in having to have an emergency C-section at the time. If the baby gets so stressed out or the placenta, it causes a placental abruption. Again, these things are rare. They're less than 1% of the time, but it is certainly a risk that you could know going into it. I don't think it's ever happened to me when I've done an ECV knock on wood but the risk is there. But over 99% of the time that doesn't happen. Important to remember. Some other things that some people might consider when considering an ECV are things that make it more or less likely to work. So overall, the chances of an ECV being successful has that kind of wide range of 60 to 80%. And I think those wide range of numbers depend on the candidate selection and the people choosing to have an ECV. So what are some of those factors? So if it is not your first pregnancy that's at term, it's easier to do an ECV. So people who have had babies in the past, their uterus is just a little bit more compliant and it's kind of easier to, to flip the baby I find than when it's someone's, you know, first baby they're about to have. Another thing is that it's easier if you can get a good handle on the baby as you're turning it. So things that get in your way between the provider's hands and the baby can decrease success rates. That can be an anterior placenta, or that can be a higher body composition of the mother. If there's more adipose tissue between the skin and the uterus, it's going to be harder to get a good grip on the baby. And so those are two things that, again, aren't contraindications, meaning you can definitely give it a shot, but might make the chances of it working a little bit less. The other thing is fluid level. If someone has low fluid, which is called oligohydramnios, then it's a little less likely to work because the baby's kind of just, you know, wrapped up in that uterus more tightly than if the baby has more fluid to kick around with and it's easier to flip around. One final note, if you're RH negative, it is recommended to get Rogan if you get an ECV. So just as my final note, there must be some scary stuff about ECV on the internet, I guess, because I have patients who have a lot of hesitation about it. Overall, I consider ECV really safe. Yeah, there's chances it won't work. Yeah, it's annoying to have to go into the hospital and get a spinal and go through it, but I think it's an awesome way to decrease our C-section rates, increase our vaginal birth rates, and really improve the experience of the end of pregnancy, labor, and birth for both moms and babies. So if your baby is breech or transverse and you're considering an ECV, I really hope this video was helpful and I do hope you consider doing an ECV and this gives you more tools about what it's like and empowers you to talk more with your provider about it. As always, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe. I have new videos every Friday and have a wonderful weekend. Good luck. I'll see you next week.